Some people are super health conscious with their days driven by early morning trips to the gym and maybe some kale smoothies. Others try their very best to avoid thinking about anything health related at all, pushing thoughts of vegetables or long walks right out of their minds. Regardless of which camp you fall in, your overall health is important and your medical history is critical data. So why is it so difficult to get access to important health information for ourselves and those we love? Is the onus all on us or is it due to a breakdown within the system? Either way, we clearly need systems and technology that support our health, and VJ Anand is the EVP of engineering at Castlight Health. He believes that technology combined with the human touch can increase everyone's health. What we actually do is a combination of things. Certainly help you with content that helps you understand why is that important and what is it. But it's also about now using the power of high touch. This is essentially a key element of what our care guides do. So on their single panel, as they support our users, they actually have your whole health profile, but also the key recommendations and the gaps that you need to be closing. Healthcare can feel like the ocean. It's huge, important, overwhelming at times, and it waves can crash down on a person if they're not careful. There's a sea of healthcare information out there, and without some assistance, no one person can gather it all, make sense of it, figure out a plan, and then act accordingly. Fortunately, we do have help. There is technology that can guide us through the data and help us figure out what to do. Well-intentioned people can be great support too. The key is getting technology and humanity working together toward the common goal of individual and community health. On this episode of IT Visionaries, VJ explains the steps we can take to create a system that aggregates health data, personalizes it, and then helps engage people in making healthy decisions. He also shares how future innovation can help those who need services the most by identifying need and targeting care. Enjoy the episode. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Innovate fast, empower every employee, and scale with confidence from anywhere with a customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have VJ Anand. He is the EVP of engineering at Castlight Health. VJ, welcome to the show. Thank you, Albert. It's a real privilege to be here. Yes, we're pumped to have you here. As everyone who listens to the show knows, I'm a, I always lean and have more interest in things that are in health and wellness which you now qualify for. But for our audience members who are not familiar with what Castlight Health does, uh, if you could go ahead and tell our audience what exactly is Castlight Health and what does it do? I'm happy to. You know, Castlight Health's mission is simply to make it as easy as humanly possible you know, for individuals to navigate the healthcare system so that they may live happier, healthier, and productive lives. All right. So that's a very hard thing to do for any of us who have been sick or injured. Uh, sometimes the healthcare system can be a real pain. There's a lot of things that we can experience pain in, whether it's booking, getting services. I know, for example, sometimes you have to go to a doctor just to get a prescription or a meeting with a specialist who has to do a scan that has to give you to a surgeon. Like it can be a really painful process. How does Castlight help make that easier? Yeah, no, I think you highlighted a number of challenges, you know, that people face, right, in navigating the healthcare system. You know, clearly, uh, the healthcare system is complicated, right? For example, when it comes to finding care, you know, there isn't an easy and single, uh, simple single place to go. Uh, you know, pricing for a provider visit, you know, or a procedure isn't as straightforward. And it feels like there are myriad options that you can consider to act on in terms of what is right for you to um, address a health condition, you know, or take advantage of the benefits that you have. You know, to me, um, this is what I, you know, call about some of the challenges in navigating the system, finding the right care, understanding your benefits, being able to manage your out-of-pocket costs, and also making sure that you're doing the right actions, you know, to uh, not fall behind in terms of staying healthy and well. Albert, as you know, you know, with the COVID pandemic uh, that we're facing, you know, these challenges have actually exacerbated, right? If you talk about the vulnerable, you know, those that are disadvantaged, living in lower 
social economic conditions. You know, they face high risks. And also, if you think about the overall population, you know, more people are deferring care, mental health needs have risen. So when you look at all of these challenges that individuals face well, for themselves and their families, naturally, employers, right, are very concerned about all of this, right? Employers have an important role to play. And they are realizing more about the importance of health, safety, and well-being of their employees is not only critical to their core people workforce strategy, but also the success of their business. So how specifically does, does your company help mitigate this process? Because I, I agree, it's a super complicated process. Pricing's not clear. How to get care is not clear. What, the pro, you know, what steps do I even need to take? You kind of hinted at that. You know, so I'm trying to picture what this, pro you know, for our audience, help our audience understand what this product is and does. Because then, you know, if I were to log in, like what happens next? So let me talk to you about what we actually do with healthcare navigation. So we are the leader in healthcare navigation. And what we provide is a digital platform, a world-class digital platform that allows members, you know, to be able to register, log in and get an engaging experience you know, to be able to find that right provider, to be able to get the right care that is not just any provider, but the provider that is the highest quality, lowest cost, and the utmost convenience for you, you know, for the conditions that you face and who you are. We are able to provide through this digital solution an easy way to understand the benefits that you're eligible for, you know, the health programs that are right for you based on the health condition, where you are on the health spectrum. And we provide an engaging experience for people to be able to act on those recommendations. You know, being able to provide you with the recommendation, but also being able to make it easy for you to act on it. You know, we also realize that, you know, providing these tools to make sure that you make the right decisions is important, but it's also important to continuously engage the users. So they're able to drive proactive, healthy behavior change. And so we have a range of well-being activities that allow, that are gamified, you know, with challenges and allows employers to tie incentives and rewards to make sure that you're able to act on those recommendations that drive positive well-being. Now, what we do is serve our employers, you know, with these tools, not just with a digital experience, but we realize that for some of the members, you know, it's important to have that human touch, to be able to have a seamless access to an expert care guide that's able to help them act on those benefits, you know, be able to resolve problems, whether they're non-clinical, you know, billing issues, or they happen to be you know, specifically health related for you. So what we essentially provide in summary is a high touch as well as a high tech, you know, platform that gives you what you need, all the tools that you need, the information, the intelligence, and helps you act on those to be able to stay healthy and well. Okay. I feel like I understand this product now. It's more like, you know, and, and again, I, I always paraphrase what you say so that I help our audience understand a little bit more too. It's almost like a, it's like a guide. It's like if you didn't know exactly what to do, you would need a guide. You need someone to help bring you, you know, whether it's evaluating services that you need or uh, treatments that you need, evaluating pricing. It's like a guiding tool. Is that right? That helps me figure out comparative information. You know, not, not that it's the same, but, you know, no different from like, um, you know, if I use Kelly Blue Book or Edmunds to help me buy a car, like I could say, hey, this is my problem or this is what I'm trying to buy. Castlight could help say, hey, you might need this type of doctor. Here are some in your area. This is how they're rated. This is what your insurance covers. Uh, this is what someone with commonly these side effects, these people commonly see these types of doctors for these types of potential conditions. Am I hitting what this is? Yes, exactly right. But the crucial part here is to also understand that this is personalized you know, for you. So we aggregate a lot of information you know, about the mm. users, your past claims, the health plan uh, information, as well as all the provider information so that we can bring it all together and give you that information you just mentioned, which is right for you at the right time, you know, always available, you know, with the self-serve experience, but also the help you need from a human assist. Got it. So this is a big, heavy, 
I mean, this feels like a big data lift. So you're the EVP of engineering. And you have to make sure this platform executes, you know, flawlessly. The first step in any type of comparative tool, well, whether we've talked to people that have, you know, created companies like Kayak, talked to people of, <laughs> like Carfax, all these different companies, like they aggregate and see a lot of information. Like it's usually the biggest first step. One of the things we've came across in the health industry specifically is how a lot of this health information, a lot of the information about the providers is actually quite fragmented and broken. It's not like there's an MLS where you can have, you know, an MLS is all the listings of the homes. Boom. You can just plug into the MLS system. And now you have all the homes. It's not like that. You have to go with disparate systems. Talk about the engineering feat it takes to bring all this data together so that it can even be compared or recommended because obviously if you don't have information, you can't recommend it. That's exactly right. You know, and uh, this is this is a huge uh, lift. And uh, if you remember, you know, Castlight, you know, we have worked relentlessly over the past decade right, and invested significant amount in technology to be able to make all of this magic happen, right? When you think about this um, key problem that we solve with data, right? It's about identifying care, but also cost-effective care, right? Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, it's about identifying and getting access to high-quality care, like I said, but that is affordable and accessible. Right. If you think about the impact of this, right, it's huge. For example, state some of the statistics about um, how there's estimates that, you know, just in the U.S. alone, we spend over $200 billion in unnecessary care. Mm. And the amount of people that actually get severely affected with medical errors, right, um, it is one of the leading causes of death in this country. So if you think about it, there is no universally accepted solution that ensures that every individual receives high quality care. So to your point about data, finding a provider, right, can be challenging. So it's not simply about aggregating provider directories, right? It's about making sure that we get additional information about their specialization. You know, are they in network or out? What is the out-of-pocket cost, right? Just to make sure that we understand the costs involved. And talking about high quality, you know, there's a number of data sources that we actually aggregate, you know, over 30 reputable and reliable data sources that we bring that data in continuously and making sure that these data sets are industry standard, right? Uh, for example, risk adjustment, sample size requirements. And we make sure that we not only take all of this data, uh, but we match members, right? Now we have data about the users, the members, and how can we actually match the right providers to the right users, you know, based on the specialization that they need and other preferences that individuals may have. And being able to now communicate that in a search, when you come into the app and search for a primary care doctor, we're able to provide you not just with the top, you know, the smart search, the top recommendations, but provide details on the quality information for each of those providers and the costs and how we determined that quality rating so that our users can trust the data. Yeah, okay, super fascinating. How do you determine quality? Because this is something that is, so, I mean, I, I feel comfortable revealing this. Uh, my family has a history of cancer. Cancer is one of those diseases where it's very unclear what's going on, right? It's not like, it's not quite like a fractured leg where, you know, if you get an operation, your leg is going to be fixed. It's a very complicated disease, right? And so quality, what, how do you guys evaluate quality? Uh, because it's one of those things where, you know, I'm curious how you do it, because this is something that I think anyone who's ever been diagnosed or afflicted with a, a disease, they, they want to get a second opinion. They want to go to the best doctors. They want to make sure that they have the best chance of, especially when it's a really grave one, right? You know, of course, everyone wants great care. But when it's a grave illness, people want the absolute best often. So how do you guys go about doing that of saying like this person is high quality, this person is a lower ranking, uh, which is pretty intense. But, you know, I'd love to understand for our audience, what are the, some of the factors that go into this? Yeah, that's a great question. And I can talk at length about this. You know, we do, in fact, published a white paper in terms of how we determine what we call a Q score. Mm. So when you actually search in our app for provider recommendations, you would actually get what we call a Q score. And this is where some of the AI and machine learning technology goes in, where we apply a variety of factors. Um, and I talked about, for example, 
everything about the provider, right? Data, I, I talked about the 30 data sources, which include, for example, not only the specialization, but also the performance, you know, a variety of performance sources for those providers. And being able to take all of that information uh, from those 30 data sources, what we do is uh, an algorithm that weights a lot of these um, uh, information about the provider and be able to use an algorithm to be able to categorize them across a spectrum of performance, right? Q scores all the way from exceptional, for example, uh, a five-star rating all the way to um, people that are in lower tiers. So we actually use a clustering algorithm to be able to now group based on those weights across these categories. And what we actually do is continuously validate you know, and make sure that these Q scores are accurate. And there's a number of ways in which we can actually do it based on continuous data feeds, you know, from these sources, as well as all of the claims intelligence that we have. So, you know, obviously you can't give away all of your proprietary trade secrets, but I'd love to understand, like, what are some of the data points that go into the evaluation? Yeah, specifically, as I said, um, you know, this is essentially, and I can I can share a lot more detail um, separately in this white paper, um, Albert, but these data sources are primarily about uh, physician performance, right? Their mm -hmm. background, their education, as well as other sources, industry standard metrics. I talked about uh, sample size requirements, you know, making sure that, you know, this is statistically significant when we get those data elements for a particular provider, as well as uh, scores in terms of risk. All right. Makes total sense. I don't want to, you know, keep probing it. If you can't share beyond the white paper, totally understand. What about, so, you know, you got this information, you verify it, qualify it, and you've developed its Q score rating. How about when it comes to, do you collect consumer feedback that gets you to any information that says, hey, these Q, like that helps maybe cross validate these Q scores. I didn't know if you also get like these inputs from the consumer side, the patient side? Uh, yes, we also, I think it's important to make sure that we get user feedback as well, user reviews, right? Uh, but what we do in our provider quality and how we handle provider search is distinguish, you know, the quality metrics that we compute so that we give you a clear view of the supply from user ratings and user reviews. And you also get that information associated with the provider. So users are often able to provide reviews and feedback on our systems, but we also look at, you know, um, for example, the Blue Cross systems and make sure that we're able to aggregate, you know, provider reviews from other sources as well. So as a user, you're able to get a clear, measurable quality score or Q score in addition to what are users um, rating and providing feedback for those providers. So, you know, when you are building your engineering teams to help solve these problems, help us understand a little bit about like how you focus or how you focus your teams to solve these problems. Like is, is Castlight mostly solving data problems? Is it, obviously you mentioned a great experience. So you have a UI UX function there as well. Uh, you of course have to process probably APIs or some type of, or maybe even, it's not even just APIs, like you got data that comes from, and I know this from working with different clients in the healthcare space is that a lot of times the data payloads come in like, like secured files. Like there's not like an easy API to connect to the information sources. Like you have payloads. So you have like data teams, you have AI teams, you have research teams. Give us an idea of how your like team is broken up and like how many people you're focusing on, on what, because we'd love to understand how you're attacking this problem. Yeah, as you said, you know, this is a multifaceted problem, right? And again, this goes back to the extensive investments we've made, you know, over the last 10 years that have built all of this capability, right? And it's complex. So when you think about, you know, all of this being powered underneath with these data pipelines, you know, all the data sources, you know, think about eligibility information that we get about youth members and the programs that are eligible for and all of the demographic information. That's important to make sure that we're able to now provide access to users and be able to make sure that we understand what their benefits are. All of the claims data that we actually aggregate, you know, from a variety of sources, you know, health plans and providers, being able to make sure that we have data that provides a user with a quick view of where do they stand on their deductibles, on their coinsurance, on their out-of-pocket costs. 
you know, what are some of the claims uh, that have come in and how can we actually ensure that they're correctly paying for the services they've uh, utilized. It is also about, you know, data um, regarding providers. We just talked about provider data. You know, those are data feeds that are coming in on a regular basis. It is also about um, the integrations. You know, one of the things that we do, and I'll talk about how the architecture of the system is structured, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we also have an extensive platform that integrates, you know, with a, a variety of point solutions and other third-party um, applications. So if you think about the architecture of the system, it's all about data aggregation and data pipelines that come in, you know, as regular file feeds, you know, through secure file transfer. Mm -hmm. It is through APIs, you know, that we actually regularly invoke uh, to be able to get information, you know, that, that could be pricing information, for example. But typically, by and large, a majority of that data comes through large file transfers yeah. with them being API-based transfers. Now, all of this data essentially comes in and we have an extensive data pipeline, right? That's built using uh, some of the real-time data technology, you know, Kafka as an example, to be able to actually publish and subscribe those elements so that the application can sometimes continuously, right, um, consume this data. But a lot of the data also gets into our data processing, data warehouses, and be able to, on a regular basis, nightly upload into our production databases. So when you log in, you're able to see the latest claims, the latest um, actions that you've taken. Now, on top of that is the platform, right? So the platform, essentially, think of it as core elements of the platform, you know, provider data. You know, it's about aggregating data from a variety of sources and building what we call a unified provider directory as you know this golden set of provider data that essentially powers a lot of the search we have the search you know an elastic search based mechanism that allows you to do free form search you know for mm. not just providers but procedures you know to be able to understand uh, different health conditions and so we aggregate data about procedures and conditions and content that we have locally created that essentially is all served through this Elasticsearch freeform capability, sort of like a Google search within the app. Yeah, yeah. And then comes the personalization engine, right? Now, all of a sudden, we have built this user profile, this 360 view of the user. And now we're able to use that to say, when you log in, what is that recommendation? What is that personalized for you recommendation that we can surface in the app saying this is relevant content for you at the moment? This is a relevant action for you. You know, it could be, for example, signing up for a program that's appropriate if you happen to be, say, at risk of diabetes. And we've got the right content and the right programs that you can sign up, which you are eligible for. Now, that genius personalization engine, as we call it, essentially segments users across a variety, almost 200 or so segments that are specific health conditions that you may fall into based on this user profile, this rich data we have about you. That happens overnight so that, you know, your current health conditions, you know, based on claims data allows you to categorize you into a particular one or more segments. Now those segments, you know, for example, you could be in a wellness segment that requires you to keep your steps up, right? Or you could be in an at-risk for diabetes segment that the best action for you may be to get the right tips around nutrition, around, um, you know, well-being um, activities, or it could be like regular A1C tests. And so these segments allow us to group users and map them to the right actions, the next best actions for them that they could act on. And we surface that recommendation, both as, you know, uh, based on your notification preferences, as a notification, as an email reminder, but it would also surface in the app when you log in. Yeah. And there's, of course, more, you know, the, the third element of the platform is what I call the integration with the ecosystem. Now, how do we make those program recommendations? You know, for example, a connect to a point solution like a Livongo or a Hinge, you know, for the specific condition. We have a rich integration API that allows us to both allow you to quickly single sign on into those programs to sign up, but also 
feedback activity information so we know how well you're utilizing the program and acting on the steps to be able to then you know allow employers to incent engagement and activity but also give you a sense for progress you know how are you engaging and utilizing and staying well so that's that whole ecosystem integration piece that is also a key part of the platform and you will see that in terms of you know the benefits the actions and how I'm able to seamlessly use it with uh, Castlight being a single front door for you. All right, this is super fascinating stuff. Real quick, Castlight, is it typically sold to the individual or is it sold to the company and provided to individual members? Is that, it sounds like it's the latter. Yeah, this is actually sold to employers, exactly right. Mm -hmm. But we also offer this to health plans, you know, as an enterprise solution. Gotcha. So they can offer that to their uh, employer customers. Super fascinating. Now, one of the things you hinted at it was the, the ability to know the user, right? And then people are, so here's the is interesting thing about people. And I think you've learned this over your career is we are horrific at assessing ourselves. So for example, you know, like I remember my father when he first said he had, you know, pain and he would stay up all night because he couldn't sleep. Yet when he went to the doctor and they said, well, on a scale of one to 10, which is a weird question to ask, right? Like on a scale of one to 10, how would you evaluate your pain? He'd be like, oh, it's a two. You know what I mean? So the doctor doesn't think it's a big deal. We notoriously see this, and I'll just speak among the people I know that, like some of the people I know that, you know, I myself am probably a little heavier than I need to be. And then people I know that are heavier than they need to be. If you ask them, do you eat a lot? They all say no. No one says, yes, I do. And so for a lot of humans, we are actually quite bad at measuring, assessing, recognizing our own behaviors, our status, outcome, activities. I learned this while at I went to grad school at Emory for public health, behavior science specifically. And we talked about, I remember doing research and seeing like how really bad we are at self-administering anything, uh, even like medication, right? There's a reason why these pill boxes got invented that had one per day because people literally couldn't remember to take their medication. And that's something that's very binary, let alone something more judgmental, like do you, am I eating well? So when it comes to getting that information from people, are you relying on self reporting or are you guys in utilizing data points from different providers to kind of recognize what I'm doing? Are there new integrations on the horizon where it's more like sensor based? Like I know I, uh, Apple iWatch, for example, can measure blood pressure, heart rates, walks, steps. Like it's better at recognizing what I do than I myself am. I'd love to hear how you're getting that personal input because I mean, like I said, people are notoriously bad at recognizing what they're doing. You know, this is a fascinating question, Albert, and I would love to answer this. Um, and to me, I think this is the core of what we do. You know, it's all about making sure that we're able to engage, right, the users yeah. on what we call the right journeys, right, for them, right health journeys for them to drive behavior change. To, to, you know, it's, it's just fascinating what you said. So just to give you a sense for what we do, right, the first thing is to be aware. You know, so when you come into the app, you actually see your whole health profile. You see the data about where you stand. You know, we track through um, a number of data sources, you know, self-reporting. Setting goals is important, right? As people set health goals, that brings them motivation, but it also gives us the key insight. We also do an assessment and a health assessment, which actually is an extensive questionnaire that allows us to get a lot more data. We take biometric data feeds. You know, you talked about mm. trackers. So we integrate with all the trackers out there so that we can actually get your steps and, you know, uh, how much you sleep and all of that data. We also, you know, as I said, integrate with a variety of programs. You know, if you happen to be using Point Solutions to track your health, you know, they could be a Livongo for, you know, diabetes management or a Hinge Health to deal with your MSK conditions. We actually get that information right? It could be nutrition programs. So this whole health profile that I talk about is actually the 360 is fed through all of this data. Now to talk about behavior change, right? This is where the personalization engine comes from and our whole engagement strategy falls together, right? So one, the mobile app is great, right? So we're able to actually get you the right notifications at the right time to get you to act on something that you need to do. But you could also allow, you know, the various well-being programs that we have, you know, whether it's um, the step sleep, you know, reminders to do certain things, 
uh, behavior changing programs, you know, allowing you to now track, for example, the one I've signed up for is I want to be able to actually um, read, you know, have this habit of reading before I go to bed. And I can actually set a simple trigger to be able to do that, that allows me to remind myself. And there's behavioral science, like you said, where if I repeat it this many times, I'm able to actually make that behavior stick. You know, it's about 30 days. <laughs> so we bring a number of these measures to try and get users to first make sure that they come back to the app to get that personalized view, to make sure that they continuously update with their inputs, but they also see the results of their data and then get recommendations to act on so that they can quickly act on them and be able to provide that incentive. I talked about incentives. So being able to tie, you know, we have a whole range of points to hit milestones and being able to redeem those points for rewards that employers can use to say, make sure you get those preventives done or make sure you get certain other things that you need. Medical, you know, adherence, for example. So it's essentially the combination of, you know, being able to get the engagement at the top of the funnel, the way I think about it from an engineering standpoint, right? with those right user journeys for you, and that's important. They need to be relevant, timely, and being able to take you through those actions, you know, those next best actions and showing you the progress and the rewards along the way. And that's essentially how we have achieved a high, you know, uh, results in terms of both steering to the right care right? Utilizing the programs. And then all of this now laddering up to health outcomes on the one side, you know, avoiding you from going from a lower risk to a higher risk segment, but rather bringing the risk down and then obviously saving medical costs for our customers. Yeah. You hit a lot of things that I see the good calorie trackers or different things that try to influence outcomes. It's like constant feedback loops. Like people need, it's like, it feels like it's never enough yet it feels also annoying but like people just need constant reminders to do all these things that you need them to do in order to change their health outcomes you know we looked into your history and it looks like you were at intuit for quite a while now intuit was very famously made taxes easier for us uh that is a very complicated thing it said hey you were part of the teams that say hey individuals can handle their own taxes if you could give them an easier way to do it so you've already been in this field. What's harder, taxes or healthcare? Because, <laughs> because I do remember the days of my dad laying out all his receipts and paperwork and like, you know, and I, and I think even the founder of Intuit, when he first went to raise money and says, I can simplify the tax code with software, people were like, that's not possible. I think he got, actually got laughed out of the room of a couple of rooms. People were like, that's not, you can't do it. Right. And then each year you have to, you know, you're in the same problems at Castlelight, which is every year new rules, regulations are going to impact your business. That's 100% happening in healthcare. It's going to happen in tax code. So give us an idea of what's easier to solve for or harder to solve for uh, tax codes or healthcare, because these are different phases of your life. But I'd love to hear your perspective on both of them. Yeah. No, I think both are certainties, aren't they? I mean, taxes are, are a certain a given that you have to deal with. And your health and well-being is an important thing that you have to deal with too. Sure. But, uh, you know, both are hard in their own way. You know, to me, I think it's just fascinating, this question, as I thought about it, saying I'm new to healthcare, <laughs> what can I bring, you know, from my experiences, right? Working uh, in FinTech at Intuit and what are things I can bring over? I can give you several examples, right? To your point, what's common is the complexity of rules. Healthcare is obviously a, an order of magnitude more, right? when you think about it. Okay. But um, certainly some of the lessons that I've learned, you know, taxes, I'll give you an interesting insight that I learned. You know, I used to assume that, okay, people that have very simple tax filings, you know, that should be easy to do in a self-serve digital way. I should be able to come into TurboTax and quickly file it. The folks with complex returns, okay, maybe they need a human being, you know, to process it. What actually turned out looking at user behaviors is some, some of the folks that had the simplest of tax returns often ended up going to a person to actually get it done and oftentimes paying 10 times the cost, right? And I would wonder why until we realized based on behaviors that it's confidence, you know, that matters. Am I doing the right thing? Oh my God, I, I'm terrified of doing this. Can I really do this myself? And will I do this correctly? And will I otherwise get audited and so on? 
So what we realized is it's not simply about simplicity and complexity. It's about how do we build confidence so people know what they're doing, they can actually do it and understand, you know, why some decisions are being made and also understand that they have the backing, right? So we introduced this simple high-touch, high-tech approach there, which I, when I came in and talked to Maeve and Castlight, I said, this seems very familiar, you know, just as Castlight was thinking about care guides, that whether you have a simple health condition or a complex one, you know, there's always that ability to simplify and give people confidence in how they're making the decisions, but also know that we have a human touch behind. So we introduced TurboTax Live over there, which was a human service backing our digital experience that got a lot of people now starting to use digital for the first time and feeling confident I can do it because I know if I'm not sure, I've got at a press of a button, somebody that can help me get it done, right? And we, we have the same thing here with care guides where anytime you're dealing with a question or a health condition or a challenge at the press of a button, you can chat or talk to a care guide. So you, right away, you took some of those learnings from helping people solve their taxes, bringing it to health. You mentioned this confidence, the confidence part of it, where people, they don't know what to do. One of the things that we also know that's interesting about health specifically is there's a subpopulation that avoids it. They just avoid it. They kind of like don't want to, it's like a, they just don't want to address it. I mean, that's why we hear these nightmare stories of people that have to get like hundred pound tumors removed from their body. It's like, dude, how did you let it get to that point? Right? People kind of have a way of deferring their personal care quite a bit. And we know that that has huge ramifications on costs, outcomes, likelihood to treat, right? We all know, like, for example, cancer, the earlier detected, earlier, more likely it's treatable. We know that. So how do you get people because those are the people that need it the most, right? How do you get people that really don't want to be involved in this to use it? Because they're like, they're the biggest opportunity for better health outcomes, really. The people that actively avoid medical attention. You know, the kind of people that don't go ever go to the dentist until they have a toothache. It's like, what? Well, it's too late. Your tooth has to get pulled out. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, this, is, this is, you know, core. When you think about navigation, it's not simply about waiting for you to utilize the tools, right? It's about how do we be proactive? Let me add a little more color. I talked about the personalization engine, right? Truly understanding who you are. Say, Albert, who are you? What is the data we have about you that allows us to understand, you know, what may be the most appropriate guidance that we can provide? So we have this term called gaps in care, you know, to be able to identify what are the things that are clinically relevant for you to do that allow you to uh, make sure that you are on top of that. And how do we actually then help you close those gaps in care? You know, you talked about the challenge of going to the dentist regularly. It could be, for example, a colonoscopy, you know, check if you happen to be 50 plus and making sure that you have done. Now there's one that most people will not do. Like they will, <laughs> they, so usually for a colonoscopy, someone's got to twist your, like for a lot, of, I'll just speak for men. Most men, like someone's got to twist their arm. Like, you know, you got to go do this. <laughs> so there happen to be, you know, what we do is, you know, we of course have rules, right? Clinically relevant um, guidance that we actually get that we track. And what we actually do is a combination of things, you know, certainly help you with content that helps you understand why is that important and what is it? But it's also about now using the power of high touch, right? This is essentially a key element of what our care guides do, you know? So on their single panel, you know, as they support our users, they actually have your whole health profile, but also the key recommendations and the gaps that you need to be closing. And so sometimes what happens is, you know, you'll see the content, you'll see the notification and say, I gotta get that done. And you have a way to schedule that appointment and go make that, close that gap. Now, the other way is to make sure that our care guides can be proactive. And we offer that as well, uh, where they can reach out and say, I can actually help you with it. And provide that human touch, sometimes the nudge that's needed for you to actually then go close that gap. There can be incentives as well to make sure that you're actually getting some of these gaps closed. So putting all of this together, Albert, is the way to actually try and make sure that we're actually delivering that higher performance. You know, how do we keep you from not increasing your clinical risk and how do we decrease it? 
is about how well we can close it. And to your point with COVID now, right, there's, we've done studies looking at our own data about how much deferred care has happened. Mm. This is an important moment, you know, to be able to now follow up on those, right? And this is something we work with our employer customers to make sure that we're actually actively closing gaps in care, just as people, you know, get uh, beyond the pandemic. Ah, so like you're actively able to see, hey, I haven't gone in for, you know, wh whatever exams I need, whether it's as simple as a dental checkup to maybe more complicated because I've had a previous, let's say, serious problem. Like if I've had a heart attack, like I need to go see my cardiologist like every whatever period of time. That's right. Um, to, like a friendly reminder. You know, I think my personal opinion is that sensors are going to be the future for getting even better care because it's considerably more preemptive. Um, we all know that the risk trackers are something that is becoming more prevalent. So I, it's awesome to hear that you've integrated that into the, your systems. Well, it ended up not working at all and being a giant fraud, but the premise behind Theranos was actually quite fascinating. And I'm curious, like I've always believed, for example, that more, more like a, our toilet water should be hooked up to some type of health scanning and sensor system because so much of, I mean, it sounds gross, but the reality is urine and stool analysis can tell quite a bit about your health. You have to provide samples quite often for many different conditions, urine and stool. And that's obviously everyone has to go. Like I, I'm looking forward to a future where your toilet has sensors like that, that can relay data up. How about for yourself, when you think of the future and innovations and health innovation, what are some things you're looking forward to or hope get invented soon that you think will really have a really great outcome on whether it's cast light products or just general human health in, in general? I'd love to hear your what you're looking forward to because you sit in a unique place of knowing where there's data, where there's not data, where is there easy data, where is there inaccessible data? And if you like, hey, if we had access to that, we could open up these opportunities for for better health. You know, this is this is uh, a key reason why I'm here at Castlight. You know, because I think I fundamentally believe when I came in, looked at the the stack, you know, the functionality, the the uh, technology that we have. It feels like, you know, we've got everything we need to now start to innovate even further, mm -hmm. right, in terms of the future of digital health. And we have all the assets to be able to go do that. So you talked about a certain dimension around how can we integrate, you know, with sensor technology. And I think that's super important to be able to get additional data sources. Let me talk about a few that I'm excited about, right? Yeah. This may be in, uh, you know, different parts of this uh, spectrum of problems that I talked about earlier. One thing that I see, I'm personally motivated, and I worked on this, you know, back in my previous job, is about making sure that healthcare actually works for everybody, right? And so mm -hmm. it's not just about those that are able to use my digital app and have access. You know, I talked about the social determinants of health, right? An important area that I would love to focus our digital health investments on to say, there's populations in this country, you know, that are in food deserts, you know, in mental health deserts. They live in zip codes, you know, particularly where quality healthcare and access to resources is a challenge. And they may not have the same access that I have, right? And so one of the things that I'm excited about is integrating data sources, you know, specifically around the various attributes of social determinants. You know, what are the programs that are available in the neighborhood, you know, if you think about even COVID vaccinations, right, there's been some access issues in terms of being able to make vaccinations available. Sure. So are there local services, local coaches? Can we get that data surfaced? Because a lot of our employers, even in our own book of business, have populations in those zip codes that actually have lower access to these. So I'm excited about how do we measure social determinants? How do we address those gaps? and making our digital and high touch solutions work for them as well. So that's one dimension, right? Now, another one, Albert, there's a plethora of you know, innovation that's happening around point solutions. You, know, you named it, right? Every day there's new digital health solutions popping up. And one of the challenges that we hear from employers is just the challenge of how do I know which program is right for who? How to target the right program at the right population, right? The right people so that they have access to that program because every program sounds great. But the question is, how do we actually help employers, you know, who have an important responsibility, right? When it comes to healthcare, manage all of this, 
And so I'm excited about this yeah. whole notion of Cast Light as a platform, right? That allows us to now easily integrate with point solutions because I've got the data and API capability to not just ingest data, but really make sure that we're able to use that intelligence to direct people at the right programs at the right time and make that utilization work. You talked about, we talked about behavior change. You know, how yeah. do we drive utilization? So what I find is there's a innovation to be had to extend the intelligence we have in our platform into this point solution world so that these solutions are not siloed, right? And they have this view that we have in terms of holistic health. What is that whole health and where do we fit in and how do we drive high utilization for the right people? And then finally, also about how do we apply AI and machine learning, right, to personalization? It's not just about knowing you to a certain level of granularity. Can we actually take that health condition granularity up, right? And micro-personalize it for you. Because today it's not about just generally segmenting you as diabetic. It's exactly where are you? So we can actually target the right solution, yeah. you know, for your specific condition. And sometimes you may have multiple conditions, you know, comorbidities. So how do we actually now say, if you've got this combination of conditions, what is now the sequence of things that we can do for you? So this is, I'm talking about now a higher order of ML to be able to segment you based on data sources in a more finer grained manner. And then being able to drive behavior change, which is ultimately the core of getting people to do what they need to do, more persuasive ways, right, than we are today. So I'm excited about all of that. Uh, you know, I'm hiring a lot of engineers, data yeah. scientists, right, machine learning engineers, you know, across my locations, right? I just opened a, a cast light center in India. Uh, to hire some of the best talent there. I build on my talent here in the Bay Area so that we can innovate more rapidly because there's so much to be done. And we have all the capabilities we can now bring to bear to this next uh, frontier of digital health innovation. Now, I'm, I'm pumped about the data science-based approach towards solving health problems because I think for all of us who have been, whether it's ourselves or family members, you start to realize that medical care for chronic illnesses is really kind of a guess and check methodology. Like they don't actually know for certainty how to solve your problem. They don't know for certainty how to diagnose your problem. So anything that gets you to the answer faster is going to be helpful. I told a story in a previous IT Visionaries episode with uh, one of the co-founders of TruePill about just getting a diagnosis for a kidney stone. It required multiple office visits. It required a CT scan and ultrasound. And ultimately, I got diagnosed with a kidney stone that could I could pass. And so I left the hospital with no medical intervention. Like there, there's no medicine. They didn't shoot sound waves in my system. It was multiple, multiple tests. The total bill rang up to over $12,000. It seems astronomically inefficient. I wasted a whole Sunday panicking, running around to different facilities. Like, oh, am I okay? Like, what's wrong with me? Because I didn't know. My nurse assured me that it was quite common for for people to come in with the kidney stones, the ER, because they don't know what's happening to them because it's it's so painful. <laughs> um, and I was like, there has to be a better way to figure this out in a more cost-effective way. I know that's just one incidence, but most people can recognize or have stories of the inefficiencies of our healthcare system. So anything that helps diagnose, treat, get me to a, a solution faster is going to be welcome. BJ, thanks for being on the show and uh, sharing the story of Castlight and what you're up to and your engineering. But let me tell you something, before you leave, it is time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to us by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. BJ, this is where we ask you questions outside of the world of work, really quick answers, so our audience can get to know you a little bit better. Are you ready? Sure. All right. You went to school in India. You went to school in the States. Which university system is more difficult, United States school or India school? You know, to me, I'm, I'm not your best academic student. And so I found it difficult on both ends, but I'm so glad I was able to actually uh, get through. <laughs> so kind, not your best academic student. We looked you up, man. You got a patent. <laughs> Our buddy VJ here, what is your patent in? You know, my uh, patent actually is, um, goes back a while ago when I was an architect for what I call the application server. So this is essentially when the web was out you know, building a way for us to do data-driven web apps. That was my patent. 
His patent is Service Framework for Distributed Object Network System. It is US 20010010053A1. If anyone wants to look it up, BJ Anand. What do you do for fun outside of work? Uh, a number of things. You know, the COVID actually taught me the power of cooking, right? Making dinner uh, for the family. And uh, it's just a whole world that's opened up. I just love experimenting with food of different kinds at home. Uh, the other one that I picked up, uh, which is uh, really fun and enjoyable, is riding motorcycles. Oh, my man. <laughs> With my son and the and the in the back roads of California, it's it's something that I've been terrified about. But when I started, I just couldn't stop. So I love it now. What kind of motorcycle do you ride? You know, I'm a relative beginner, so I've got a Kawasaki 650. But you know, I ride up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, but I'm hoping to graduate to one of the uh, one of the Harleys. So. Oh man, Kawasaki 650. Soon we're going to see VJ rolling on a Harley. He sounds like a great dad. You helped your son get a motorcycle and you love cooking. I feel like this is great. This is, <laughs> this is a great family, man. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's been fascinating to discover, you know, new things. Uh, but there's, this, you know, of course I love like many others, you know, being able to um, do things with family, you know, do some reading. And I'm looking forward to traveling again, which I completely miss over the last year and a half. I haven't been able to get out there. Hey, listen, every country, uh, as someone who is now traveling, the one thing I recommend for people that are about to travel, especially internationally, is you've got to know what the rules are to return to the United States. So I'll give you an example. Here's something we take for granted in the United States, which is COVID testing for a lot of us is, is free. The government's picking up the tab. Local governments are picking up the tab. In international, it's not free and you need a negative test to fly back. So as a family of five, we got hit with surprise 500 plus dollar expense just to produce negative COVID tests so we could fly back from Costa Rica. So a little, little trick out there, definitely learn wherever you're going, whatever the, you got to know what the entry requirements are. You need to know what the exit requirements are. Cause I think that's not going to change for a little bit. That's a great tip. <laughs> well, VJ, it's awesome having you today on IT Visionaries. Thanks for sharing all the things that you were doing at Castlight. And I wish you all the best and success in your engineering efforts, because hey, listen, if you guys figure it out, I get to benefit. This is going to be fantastic. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. <laughs>